I'll be honest, we've had some technical difficulties for this webinar, um, and uh, it's been challenging to put all this together, but uh, we felt a lot of urgency about the moment of the whirlwind that has been happening around Ferguson, and a few people have asked us uh, to make a webinar um, that is actually a webinar version of a presentation we do um, at the Momentum Training. Um, and uh, this, I'm, I'm going to do it, but uh, generally I've done it with multiple different people. And this is a, a presentation about something that I feel very close to my heart, which is uh, how to do uh, prophetic promotion. Well, what is prophetic promotion? Well, when I was uh, organizing in the union, uh, Unite Here Local 11, in Los Angeles, this this union was an amazing machine at mobilizing people, but it, it knew how to mobilize people through its own structure. And uh, what that means is that they could mobilize their members primarily through relationships that their organization had with their members. And you can predict almost exactly how many people were going to come up to the march based on one-to-one -one confirmations that their organizers would have with all the leaders in their workplace. And their, the ups and downs and fluctuations of the organization and how much they could mobilize was really having to do with how pumped up their leaders were and how strong their leadership structure was. And they knew that way in advance, that each organizer had 20 leaders and they had 20 organizers. So you know they knew the, there was like a metrics. There was like 200 committee and each committee could mobilize five to, to 10 people. So when I came into this environment, I learned that way of mobilizing and it was fascinating to me. I'm like, wow, this thing is a machine. Uh, and it could mobilize you know, on a, on a good day 800 people, sometimes 1,200 people to protest um, on a monthly or bi-monthly basis. But when I was actually in the student organizing world, in the global justice world, it was a very different thing. It was almost like concert promotion. I wasn't mobilizing through organizations or relationships. I was mobilizing through hype, through promotion, through marketing, and through the media. Uh, in a lot of ways, there was all these people that were outside of any relationships that I had that found out about the action, that was excited about it, that was then mobilized uh, to it. And this is how we mobilized for Seattle, for A16, which was the, the mobilization to shut down the meetings for the World Bank and IMF. And when I went into the labor movement and I talked to them about how I did mobilizing, uh, they were blown away by that. They had no idea of how to mobilize in that way. It was a totally different organizing tradition that I had learned through the mass protest or the direct action movement in the global justice movement. And I want to tell you a little bit of a story that I'm going to refer back to again and again and again. But um, that, that type of organizing is almost kind of magic for them who, who had learned in structure. And we had uh, developed in, in 2006 an action called um, the September 28th Mobilization for Immigrant Rights. And we build it as the largest civil disobedience in Los Angeles history for immigrant rights. And this was very challenging to do because in some ways we were in conflict with the union and the labor movement and a lot of the established immigrant rights organizations who did not want to do prophetic promotion. Um, and just to, to talk about this a little bit, uh, in September, uh, in 2006, May 1st, 2006, there was some of the largest protests in the nation's history. Millions of people uh, marched. In Los Angeles, 1.2 million people marched on May 1st, and there was a general strike that shut down a good portion of the economy. And we mobilized through our structure, uh, the Unite Here did, and mobilized about 800 people. But our little, the amount of people we mobilized through our structure was insignificant to the ocean of people that you could see on a building top. You can look out uh, miles down a road into the horizon, and all you see is just people with white shirts. And our red shirts, our union shirts, are just little tiny specks. And even workers who were totally uh, in our workplaces were mobilized, not even through our relationships. We saw on the screen all these leaders that 
we had been trying to get to union actions and they showed up, but they didn't show up through our organization. So we're like, how in the hell is this happening? And how is this movement happening? Lots of people in the labor movement and in the immigrant rights movement in Los Angeles wanted to keep the momentum going. And so we, uh, I was, I was sort of invited into strategy meetings with Maria Elena Durazo and Dolores Huerta and a lot of other people to figure out how do we keep the momentum alive? How do we keep on generating trigger events? So we developed an action and it was very scary for the labor movement to do, to, to mobilize outside their structure. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more, but I just want to say when we announced this action that we were going to shut down the, this corridor to the airport and do the largest civil disobedience in Los Angeles history. We had Dolores, Dolores Huerta, Marilyn Odrazo, who's like a local celebrity, a labor leader. We had all these immigrant rights leaders and labor leaders, and, and we were announcing this action. And the media that we got just to announce this, this big prophetic vision of an action was larger than we normally get for a typical action that we mobilize through a structure. And it's because we used a lot of the principles of prophetic promotion. And the day that we actually, the action hit, we had uh, Ben Harper and Tom Morello did a concert for our action. We mobilized thousands and thousands of people, more than any other labor action I had ever been participated in in Los Angeles. And the press was extreme. We got more press coverage, 10 times more press coverage than any other action that we had done in the past. And, um, and also, we had people coming to get arrested that were not through our structures, not through relationships. Um, it, we actually, at, at, in the end, there was so much fear about it escalating too fast for the union to have a form of control over. Or they, there was a lot of fear about how it was going to affect the political relationships. That this is the first time in the history that I, in my experience working for the union, where they actually said, don't mobilize people, stop organizing students. Uh, I got a phone call. I was totally shocked. I was doing nonviolence trainings, and my Susan Monado, you know, my my lead at the time, told me, "Do not mobilize more students to get arrested because um, the police department and Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa was scared that we were going to um, create a citywide crisis and that they were going to have to call in the national guard." And for me. <laughs> This was one of the greatest accomplishments of my life. I thought, if any protest you create as a student radical, they have to call in the National Guard. It like puts you in the historical moment. It puts you into the history books as one of the most epic actions in, in not just Los Angeles history, but the, the whole country. And so it's like a you know student organizer wet dream. But they had to call in the National Guard. But the union was totally scared and, and had a lot of... Uh, of um, you know legitimate concerns, you know uh, I think a lot some of their fear was legitimate and that it was going to affect their political relationships. But for me, in the student organizing world, where we're mobilizing with prophetic promotion, that that was actually a, quite a big accomplishment. In the end, it was the largest civil disobedience in Los Angeles history. We got 325 people arrested. There was hundreds of other people that wanted to get arrested that we said no, including Ben Harper. We refused to get Ben Harper arrested because he didn't. He did not fit all this criteria that we had uh, for people getting arrested, and um, but it got massive amounts of press, and and we mobilized in a totally different way than what the structure knew how. And so this was this was a really great experience for us, and we learned a lot of things about how to mobilize it. We had we had taken best practices from this mass protest tradition, or we, sometimes we call it the momentum tradition, or the direct action movement tradition, that really knows how to create these actions. So in one of the big differences, if you can go to the next slide, we don't. The next slide is one of the big differences is that in, in our structure tradition, when, uh, the, when you're a union or you're an established community organization, you're really you, you're mobilizing people primarily through your own organizational structure. And it takes a lot of energy and paid organizers to go out and organize people or even volunteers and so you have a limited amount of resources to mobilize people so you're really trying to create the biggest bang for your buck you don't want to go big 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 without actually having a very laser focused strategy for how it's going to create leverage against your target um, and the goal is to create leverage now when we're talking about the momentum 
uh, tradition or civil resistance. When, when we were doing uh, the metrics of how do these movements secede, how do they create polarization, how do we create active public support? And I want to say that one more time. What's the theory of change? Active public support. It's about generating a critical mass of active public support. And we're not focusing as much on the target. We're focusing on generating that active public support. And we, we do this... Um, in the momentum training, we have everybody talk about the history of their movement, and we have them talk about the major events that, that they knew mobilized both their membership of the movement, like the climate justice movement, and what changed public opinions around climate justice. Or you name whatever issue, economic uh, justice issues, police brutality, you name it, any issue group, and you talk about the history, and what you'll realize is the major events that move public opinion are trigger events and moments of the world. And the presentation that we do before this is, and we have it in the advanced um, webinar series, is talking about uh, trigger events and moments of the world and what are they, how do they work. But really, the difference of prophetic promotion versus a lot of other actions is we are actually talking about what are the techniques to create trigger events. And occasionally these trigger events turn into moments of the world when, where there's multiple trigger events and where actually activity emerges from the bottom. Uh, this is happening right now with uh, the Ferguson protest and Black Lives Matter, but it's happened many times after Seattle, after um, Occupy uh, got off, had some trigger events. All of a sudden, there's this, there's this emergent activity from the bottom up. Um, and that happens uh, uncoordinated a lot of times, or not centrally coordinated. And that's what we call a moment of the whirlwind. There's so much polarization that it creates this critical mass that creates all this activity all around. Um, so really, that's where we're trying to get to. We're trying to create moments of the whirlwind. That's how movements really win, is they, they escalate to that, to that level. And they do that by creating trigger events that occasionally turn into moments of the whirlwind, because a lot of times you can't control um, whether or not you create a moment of the world in, but you certainly can control uh, if, you, if you do prophetic promotion right, you can really create trigger events. And I'm going to talk about how you do that. So if you go into the next slide. We don't? Next slide. So the first thing you need to do um, that is very common is that uh, you want to work with the weather, okay? So there's already trigger events that are happening in the environment. Uh, these, these trigger events are, there's many different types of trigger events. Uh, there's political things that happen, like the, the president makes an announcement, or there's a summit, or there's a catastrophe, or there's a natural disaster, or... Um, or there is, uh, you know, an event, some sort of event that happens. And what we're talking about when working with the weather is that a lot of times trigger events, um, those things can be very influential to your movement regardless of what your movement does. For instance, um, Katrina or uh, Sandy, uh, those natural disasters, really had huge effects on public perceptions around climate change. But we're talking about here not just about whether or not those trigger events affect public opinion, but a lot of times the most influential thing happens within a movement when the movement works with the weather. If, if a trigger event emerges and explodes and, and, and it rains in the weather, then the movement takes it and capitalizes on it and uses it um, or funnels it into real movement activity. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, and there's a lot of there's a whole spectrum because a lot of times the trigger event is pretty small and what the movement does really makes it much bigger. So it's it's primarily created out of the the movement's activity. And sometimes it's it's a huge event and the the movement just creates uh, some activity so that it frames what is happening within the weather. Well, one example that on the spectrum is the World Trade Organization had a summit in Seattle that was going to be probably a New York uh, Times front page story where all these national, international leaders, including President Clinton, was getting together in Seattle to renegotiate 
the, uh, the WTO um, agreement about trade, and we organized a shitload of people to then shut down Seattle and shut down, uh, shut down the World Trade Organization. As we say, the action scenario, the symbolic uh, victory of the action scenario was shut the fucker down, and that's what happened in Seattle. Uh, but because the national spotlight was already on Seattle, it was much easier. We probably would have got it no matter what because shutting down an entire city, they did call in the National Guard, <laughs> became a huge, huge action and really did create a trigger event. But the fact that they were using the WTO and the fact that the WTO, there's all these negotiations that had horrible effects on whether or not um, countries in Africa could get pharmaceutical drugs for AIDS patients. Or, um, and whether or not uh, there was environmental regulations for sea turtles so that they could survive without being extinct and all these things that were happening all across whether or not steel workers were being protected in the United States instead of in China where the, they would manipulate trade laws to protect their uh, Chinese steel. So all these things were happening and uh, that was already a focal point but the movement took it and made it into a, a big trigger event and then also it created a moment of the world win because multiple trade summits replicated spontaneously through that activity. There's a lot of examples of this sort of happening around trade summits or meetings, the UN meeting around climate change in Copenhagen. Um, just recently there was a UN meeting around climate change in New York and there was a huge protest around it and it was working with, with the weather. Another thing that we talk about, next slide, is a lot of times there's political political events, um, where there is a political election, where there's a, there's a spotlight on a candidate or on the president or on the, the Congress around a piece of legislation. The, we did this, um, we did a series of actions that didn't really create a trigger event, but we were trying to use um, Obamacare and all the spotlight around Obamacare, and it did create some momentum, just the fact that it was in the front page of the news and everyone was talking about it, everyone wanted to be part of trying to push for a public option within uh, Obamacare. But one of the biggest examples of this is H HR 4437, also called the Sensenbrenner Bill that was passed by Congress, which was this absolutely horrible uh, piece of legislation that was anti-immigrant and was going to prosecute uh, undocumented immigrants and, force and deport them, and it was actually going to hurt um, people who were even even supporting undocumented immigrants and make it a felony or a misdemeanor just to provide food or services for undocumented immigrants and that created this huge public backlash that the movement used to do a series of actions that led to May 1st uh, 2006 which as I said was one of some of the largest protests in American history certainly in Los Angeles history and there was an effective general strike in Los Angeles and other cities so uh, SB 1070 which is um, the, this horrible racial profiling law in Arizona is another example of that. There's many different sort of political events that the movement can capitalize on and use to mobilize or create an action that creates a, a better trigger event and a moment of the world win. Um, then there is, uh, next slide, there's natural disasters that um, can be used. I think one of the biggest examples of this was um, uh, this is the, the BP oil spill, um, but there's, a, there's other things like Three Mile Island, there was a nuclear disaster in the 80s that the anti-nuclear movement used uh, and did tons of protest activity around that and that really changed public opinion around uh, nuclear power in the United States of America. But the thing is, is that a lot of times there was, there is all, there's disasters that happen a lot. And the example I use a lot of times is an immigrant rights movement. There were these horrible raids that were front page New York Times and Los Angeles Times. They would, they would do these stories that would freak the shit out of, out of uh, the whole community. It was horrible for the community. People were scared to come out of their house because there was these raids, these huge INS raids on uh, workplaces and even publicly in certain areas of Los Angeles and it would scare people um, so badly but there was no political mobilization there was no protest actually it demobilized people and so what I was saying is when when censor burner came out the fact that the movement used it and and made it into an empowering thing really changed not just public opinion but it changed the movement 
that you can you can have trigger events, but if you don't um, that are created by the weather, but if you don't actually do something with them, then a lot of times the public opinion doesn't change and it doesn't create a movement. So Three Mile Island is a perfect example of there was multiple disasters, but because the movement really used it and created protests and activities around it that didn't become a, a, a moment of the whirlwind, um, nu nuclear concepts around nuclear power and the public actually turned, public opinion actually turned against nuclear power. But there's a lot of examples like Katrina, um, uh, Sandy Hook, the disaster of uh, school shootings that changed public opinion around um, around gun violence that allow people to uh, mobilize. Uh, really recently, the killings of uh, Michael Brown and Eric Garner and, and uh, has really been able to be very empowering in mobilizing people and generating a movement. Uh, a disaster and a crisis in, in our communities around police brutality. Um, so anyways, uh, those, those have helped and those are just another example of many different disasters. Um, I'm not going to say uh, there, we wanted to create a new slide, the next slide, uh, that specifically talk a lot about how repression from the police, not, no, this is the blank slide, but uh, how repression in the, from the police um, and, uh, and how that's targeted at uh, activists or at um, different populations um, uh, in, in Black Lives Matter, seeing how police brutality is, is focused on or um, has uh, in horrible impacts to the black community in the United States. Uh, but this has also been trigger events in other countries, like in Egypt, uh, the, the revolution was mounted partly on police repression and police brutality uh, from the, the Egypt police uh, killing activists or people who, who even were um, innocent, uh, and the movement then organized around that. So um, we have a lot of those examples. So I, I want to just uh, open it up for questions right now for Guido, if he has any questions about organizing uh, around the weather of all pre-existing trigger events and moments of the world. Okay, sorry, we had we had a little interruption um, and we needed a little break, so we're back on. And uh, Guido asked the question of, is there any way you can sort of tell? And there's going to be a little bit of echo. Just you're going to have to ignore it because we're I'm in a big building, so it's echoing a little bit, but. The question is, how do you know if an event um, is going to create momentum or it's good to build around, and uh, and how can you like prepare for them? Well, there's certain things that if after time of being a community organizer, or even in the tradition of the direct action movement or the mass protest movement, we're used to sort of cueing into what's going on in the general population and, and what's agitating people in the general population and, and among the people that we're trying to mobilize. And we can sense that around any issue that comes up because we're talking to our people if it's whatever movement it is, whether it's climate change or whether it's not, it's about labor issues. We can tell that there's certain things like you know living wages and there might be some legislation where like, yeah, the workers really care about this or in immigrant rights. Oh yeah, the the sense of Brenner bill is really creating a lot of uh, momentum. And you can also do that scientifically through polling, where instead of just you being tapped into your, your base constituency that's going to mobilize, you are actually reading polls to see that people are really pissed, that there's lots of activity, that there's lots of people's opinions are being changed. Um, the media is a huge source of whether or not that's happening. Uh, and um, but also, you know, there are certain things that we know. Uh, the, the, the Serbians in, uh, uh, that formed Octpor realized that there was always a trigger event that was happening around elections being stolen in their country. So they realized they needed to organize and escalate to that trigger event and turn that into a moment of the world win that would take down a dictator. And since uh, that, in Chile and in, in Serbia, in, in uh, U the Ukraine, they created the movement around the idea that they knew 
uh, that they can create a moment of the world in a general strike around uh, an election being stolen by the dictator. So they organized their whole movement around that. They had multiple trigger events before they got to that, that climax, but that became a huge focal point. Um, a lot, a lot of times there's anniversary dates that we know are, are really important uh, that we can mobilize around. But a lot of that has to do with, with – that makes sense, Guido? So now we're going to talk a little bit about – instead of just organizing around trigger events that happen within the weather, we're like, well, there's a long history of within civil resistance, within the momentum tradition, uh, we feel is creating people, creating your own trigger event. Uh, and this, a lot of times people always say, oh yeah, that's because of this event. You know, if it wasn't for um, Sandy, we wouldn't have had this big event. If it wasn't for Three Mile Island, if it wasn't for the WTO convention, we wouldn't have created a trigger event. But that's not really true. I mean, the movements, um, are strong enough and they have the capacity to do prophetic promotion, they create events that are generated solely from the movement. And a good example of that would be Birmingham. Um, Birmingham was a crisis that they, they engineered, they created. Uh, and it wasn't perfectly as planned, but they knew they had to escalate and generate a huge sugar event that in the end, um, really was one of the climactic moments in American history, but uh, certainly in the civil rights movement, changed drastically public opinion. So um, that is, and we have a, we have a lot of, of, of those events happening within movements. Gandhi, uh, the way the, the Indian National Congress talked about him is uh, he was this master of sort of tapping into the weather of the country, but they, he also could create the weather. He could create these moments, and people were amazed at Gandhi's capacity to do that, that with, he was able to create these historical moments and these events, uh, and he, he was imbued by these almost like um, magical, mystical powers of being able to create something that could uh, mobilize the country that uh, many political leaders thought was apathetic until uh, he was able, he said, uh, to use these principles he said are kind of like, it's kind of like science. It's like night and day if you know how to use the principles. It wasn't his charisma, but rather the principles of civil resistance that created these events. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. What Gandhi talked about is the critical elements for creating trigger events. Next slide. Is about um, next slide, is about what, what uh, high levels of disruption and sacrifice. So when we were talking about the structure organizing within the union, we, we a lot of times because the structure wants to get the biggest bang out of their buck, they want to create leverage and they, they can't mobilize massive amounts of people. They, they, they generally focus on, on lower sacrifice, lower disruption actions because the high disruption, high sacrifice actions create lots of risk it takes a lot of resources, and um, and a lot of times for a structure, it's not worth it. They don't know how to utilize that, uh, how to create high disruption, high sacrifice. But if you really look at every single trigger event that the movement created, uh, or even a lot of times, even the ones that are created from the weather, it, it's ones that you're using tactics that are highly sacrificial. And we, we went over the spectrum again. You know, if you look at the spectrum, there is... There's tactics like picket lines that are more low sacrifice. They might be a little bit more disruptive, but really they, they're on the, the low sacrifice, medium disruption level. But if you really talk about, we call it the in next slide, if, if you can move on to the next slide, um, the, the real three uh, uh, greatest hits of nonviolence is mass civil disobedience, with jail solidarity, meaning people go to jail for extended periods of time in large amounts of numbers. Uh, there is a building takeover where lots of people are taking over a space for extended periods of time. There is long marches and there's hunger strikes and there's general strikes. All those things, if you can pull one of those things off, you're generally going to create a trigger event. If you can get 
um, the largest civil disobedience in your city where you have hundreds and hundreds of people going to jail and they choose to stay in jail for a period of time, you, the media is going to be interested. And there's a phrase uh, in local media and in national media too uh, that they joke about, uh, newscasters talk about, if it, if it bleeds, it leads, meaning that it's the lead story if it can create a lot of sacrificial energy, a lot of disruptive energy. Um, and a lot of times we, we create actions that allow people to make a choice. They have to make a choice um, or we provide an atmosphere which people can make choices to elevate the cause through their, their sacrifice. And, and Gandhi said there's a special power about lots of people choosing to sacrifice and make a big sacrifice and that elevates the pain and the suffering and the violence that's already in the system. Already, people are getting screwed over, and there's some, there's so much institutional violence. But by us choosing to take it on us, onto ourselves, and do it in a way uh, that can dramatize it to the public, the, it elevates the cause, the value of the cause, the importance of it, and also disruption. But you have to be careful about disruption because if you have too much disruption without sacrifice and it's not around the right cause, a lot of times it will alienate people. But disruption really does, if you shut down some streets, if you affect mass public transit, if you affect people's workplaces, they're going to care. It makes them have to take a stand. So high levels of disruption, a high level sacrifice in, at a critical mass will always get you a critical uh, a trigger event. It just The question is how much do you have to escalate? How high do you have to escalate? And because, um, so if you go to the next slide. So if we know that that um, that to, for us to create a trigger event, there's a critical mass of sacrifice and a disruption to create that. How do we actually get to that point? Especially when we're not like a union, uh, and like in Local 11, they even had a great union that knew how to mobilize a crap load of people, 800 people in a month, you know. But you know, most of the time we don't have that level of organization, and most movements don't. Uh, so they have to work outside of a structure, and for them, um, it, it would seem like it's harder to mobilize because they don't have a structure, and sometimes they have a little bit of a structure, or there might be people that are going to join, like a union, that are going to be have a structure to bring in, but really, how do you organize in a way that creates this critical mass of sacrifice and destruction for a trigger event, and this is what we call prophetic promotion is, is really how there, there's a whole nother technology if you can go to the next slide um, there's a whole nother technology about how to mobilize within a structure that has a lot to do with developing leadership and doing confirmations and what we call numbers numbers and confirmations in the structured organizing tradition is a lot about the science of how to mobilize people um, through relationships but prophetic promotion is really how you organize outside of a structure how do you, when you don't have much of a structure? And a lot of times, um, they actually work really well together. So we're not necessarily saying don't do the structure-based organizing. In Occupy, there was a great combination of mobilizing people through the media, mobilizing people through um, prophetic promotion, but also mobilizing people who were part of pre-established structures. Uh, and prophetic promotion kind of helps with both, but really it focuses more on how to mobilize people outside of the structure. If you can go on to the next slide. So, um, next slide. So this is this is a little bit different. In the structure tradition, it's biggest bang of your buck. They don't know how to absorb momentum after it's created. There, it's really risky for them to create a vision if they don't follow through. Um, they don't have the metrics. They're not thinking about. They're thinking about leverage. They're not thinking about changing public opinion. So all these things create an environment where it doesn't. It's, it's very scary to escalate. But what we're talking about with prophetic promotion is exactly the opposite. When I was a student radical and I was organizing within the global justice movement, having a big action is a lot how I gained resources. It's a lot of how not just me but the whole movement gained resources by doing something really big. And really, it's it's um, it, it it takes using the media. It takes pitching an action really big. It means a big vision. It means escalation, and it means also having momentum. And what I mean by momentum is that there a lot of times there's actions or a trigger event in the in the weather that we talked about that creates 
creates so so much activity already and people want to do something there's already the energy that exists so what you're doing is you're creating an outlet for people to participate uh, that are already engaged um, and maybe maybe you don't know that they're going to show up but if you know there's momentum you know that if you have something that can can funnel that uh, it could be used for the movement so you need a big vision you need an escalation plan and you need momentum and that creates the capacity to do something historic and big beyond any capacity of any individual organization or your organization. Um, in some ways, people vote with their feet. You create these actions and you create a pitch and it, it builds and builds like a snowball until it becomes a reality. Uh, and a lot of this has to do with the idea of the action. The action has to be enough so that in some ways it, it it helps everyone to have a bigger action than what they could do individually. So the next slide. The biggest element of this is an action scenario. Action scenarios really matter. Um, it needs to be a big, big vision. And uh, when we, when I was organizing within a structure within the union, a lot of times action scenario was secondary because workers showed up to picket lines not based on the the excitement of a picket line. Uh, sometimes they, they liked a picket line, but it wasn't, it was really repetitive. They did it because they believed in the issue, they believed in the power of the union, they really believed in, in the vision of winning something. But when it comes to like a con, you're, you're promoting a concert or you're promoting a, a big action, um, you need to have a big vision that people want to participate in. And, and because it's the biggest thing, it's this big vision, people want to participate in it. And they, everyone wants to. Uh, be part of it. Um, is it exciting or is it not? And you have to think about that. In 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 structure-based organizing, confirmations and numbers. It's like eighty. We, we have this phrase, uh, this motto that somebody told me is eighty percent of an action is turnout. It's like it's all about getting people there, <laughs> and it's less about actually thinking about what the action is about. Well, it's, with prophetic promotion, it's exactly the opposite. The action is a huge portion of why people are going to be mobilized, just like a concert. Like people have an image and an understanding of what they're going to experience at a festival or a concert, and that's why they actually go. So you have to really think about the action scenario, and you have to talk about the action scenario, what it feels like, what the symbols are, wh how it works out, what are the numbers, how big is it going to be. All that really makes a difference, and it changes everything. Even organizations' participation changes because they are part of something much bigger than themselves. Next. So this concept is not um, of having a big vision and mobilizing people around it. If you can go to the next slide, um, is not new to me. Lots of people talk about this uh, in civil resistance, in um, in marketing, in business. Um, one of the the influential thinkers around this concept um, is a guy who organizes. He calls it through swarms, through decentralized organizational structures. And he formed the Pirate Party. His name is Rick Falk Vinge. I, I don't know how to say his name. I hope I pronounced it right. But he, uh, he formed the Pirate Party, and he formed it around an epic vision of creating a new party. And he, he has a whole TED Talk about this concept. And he says, to form your swarm, which is a different type of organizing outside of traditional institutions, um, in a decentralized way to form your swarm around a, you ha around a provocative idea, put your stick in the ground, announce your goal. When you provide such a focal point, a swarm intelligence emerges. Your goal must be tangible, it must be credible, it must be inclusive, and he, he really emphasized this, beyond all else it needs to be epic. It needs to energize people, it needs to be electrified people. Shoot for the moon, on second thought, don't shoot for the moon. We've already been there. Shoot for Mars. You can only form a swarm around that which is epic. Okay. So uh, in this slide, you really see that it is he's generating resources partly because people want to join something that's really big and really epic. And you have to think about what is an action scenario that's going to do that. Next slide. Well, another uh, thing in next slide, the biggest, uh, there's this management book. Um, uh, it's a management book uh, about business, um, and it's talking about actually very established business uh, organizations. 
And it says that one of the biggest things that makes these lasting institutions work is that actually, occasionally, a big these big organizations and corporations and stuff will change will change the whole market and everything the way they do by 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 choosing a he calls it a big hairy audacious goal and that reorients the company and I saw this even in the union when we focused on something epic outside of just the union using prophetic promotion it really shifted everything within the union and it actually allowed the union to mobilize more people and so Jim Collins who wrote Built to Last and Good to Great uh, which are these uh, some of the biggest selling management books um, in the last 10, 20 years. The power of the big, hairy, audacious goals is that it gets you out of thinking too small. A great, big, hairy, audacious goal changes the time frame and simulates and creates a sense of urgency that isn't when you're just thinking small. You, the, the, the metaphor is if you're, if you're building a cathedral, um, it doesn't motivate people to just focus on, uh, on bricks and mortar. Uh, so next slide. Um, so in the structure tradition, we were saying is escalation um, and pitching something big and prophetic is has with it lots of risk and liability. And that's why unions and structured organizations aren't going to do prophetic promotion because a lot of times they lose a lot. They have to generate a lot of resources and they don't have a way to absorb it into a new organization or to an email list. Um, like the union that uh, that was a huge part, the County Federation of Labor, that was a, one of the biggest institutional players in the immigrant rights movement in 2006, spent hundreds of thousands of dollars just on speakers uh, for to broadcast and have a stage for this mass march of, of hundreds of thousands of people, and they didn't have any way to generate resources. They don't know. They don't have an email list that's very sophisticated to absorb the momentum or or gain resources. So for them to escalate and go really big, it really does change public opinion, but it doesn't really build their organization very much. When a movement is exactly the opposite, it, it's for us. There's less risk and liability because for we we gain resources from it and we gain public opinion changes and everything, and we don't have the pre-established uh, organizational relationships with with the police with politicians so we don't really risk very much actually by generating a lot of publicity we become credible uh, in popular a lot of times in momentum driven or in mass protest movements next slide next slide so the um, we have to ask the question how do we pitch this these actions if we're going to do prophetic promotion how do we actually pitch it and um, we went over a lot of these concepts already within uh, within the the momentum training. Uh, the first one we went over is that you have to really make a strategic choice, both to frame it around a popular symbolic issue that the the population really resonate, resonates with. Your base needs to resonate with it, and the the general uh, American public needs to generate needs to resonate with it, and that means the middle, not not everybody. We want it as Frank Luntz, the, our Republican um, opposition. What he talks about is that he wins by energizing the base, by uh, winning over the passive middle, and by isolating our opposition. And so we're thinking like that. What is an issue? Uh, so uh, immigrate immigrant rights or the dream movement around. Uh, dreamer legislation that uh, legalizes um, immigration for for students or young people that have come over uh, when they were young. All those issues were very popular, really resonated with our base. They were popular with the middle, and uh, we, th that really helps because then when you polarize, you move the public for you around certain pieces of legislation. But also, you really need to frame your victory. What's the action scenario? You need to have an action scenario with a symbolic victory uh, around your action. And we talked a lot about that in framing the victory, is people have to do the action and feel victorious. And you could frame it around an action scenario, like we're going to get, it's going to be the largest civil disobedience in, in Los Angeles history. And we were the largest civil disobedience in Los Angeles history. So everyone felt that that was a successful action. With with this with Seattle shutting down the World Trade Organization in '99, it was about shut the fucker down. So we shut it down. Therefore, it was victorious. So you have to choose what is the how are you going to frame victory from the action. So you have to have that. 
You have to have a symbolic issue. You have to have you have to frame the victory of the action. And the second thing is you have to make it historical, important. And as Rick said, you have to make it epic. Don't shoot for the moon. Shoot for Mars. You have to do something. A lot of times, it's really helpful to use things like it's the largest, the biggest, the first time, the most influential. There's so many examples of this. You know. When we were doing the action for September 28th for immigrant rights, we said it was the largest civil disobedience in Los Angeles history. Bill McKibben and 350 do this all the time, and they, they say it's the largest march in in um, in climate justice history or in the climate movement, or it's the largest civil disobedience uh, in the last year or within the movement or whatever. Right? So you, 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 can, you can frame it as historical, and there's ways to do that and really make it feel influential, but then downsize it with words, and I, we joke about this a lot, like this is the most historical first time in the history of the United States, no, yeah, in the United States that we have had a prophetic promotion webinar with this many people, you know. Uh, so you, this is the first time we've had a momentum training in, uh, that there's ever been a momentum training, uh, and it's the largest training in in watershed history, you know. Uh, so you you can you can frame it and then make it make it real through saying it's one of or it's it's within the history or it's the largest sense. Um, since uh, you know, like I, somebody pitched this idea to me that we're going to do the largest uh, university building takeover since Kent State. You know, uh, that was, that's a great way of, of of framing it so that it's historic, it's unique, it's big, it sounds epic, but yet it still is true and accurate to the historical account. But even if you get a debate about is this the largest, is it this most influential, a lot of times that creates a buzz with it. Uh, so we really want you to focus on how to talk about it as the biggest, or it's the first time, or it's the most influential, it's the largest, and put that into your action. It really helps, and I, I'll give you an example of this. Um, when I, um, if you can go on to the to the next uh, two two slides, um, so anyways, uh, the. The what is possible? It's like uh, when we were were pitching the largest civil disobedience in Los Angeles history. We did a press conference, and we got more publicity from the press conference than we we got generally from doing the largest action that we'd ever done uh, in the history of, the, of of our union was 2004 in Beverly Hills, and we got more press just by announcing it. And we were wondering why. Well, part of it was a lot of factors that I'll talk about, like big speakers, and we had a lot of credibility. But another thing is that people, the, the media really caught on to the idea of the largest civil disobedience in Los Angeles history and what that would look like and how it was scary. It created this anticipation. And so at the end of the press conference, after we announced this whole vision, we were wondering, why is the press so interested in this? And I tell you, the first five questions were about, is it the largest civil disobedience in Los Angeles history? What is it going to look like? Is it really what was the largest one in the past? All these questions around the the how we framed it as historical. People wanted to be historical, and I'll give you another example. You know, my friend uh, Kai Newkirk, who is helping me put together this presentation, he did this action in the Supreme Court, and he smuggled in a a, uh, a hidden camera to to vote videotape it, and they pitched it as the first time in history uh, that there was ever a um, a video of the Supreme Court protest. There had never been one in the past. And because of that, it, it got all this publicity because people thought it was this historical event where, you know, really it was just another heckle event. There have probably been a thousand of them, but there had never been one in the Supreme Court and it had never been videotaped. Well, there was one in the Supreme Court, but it had never been videotaped. So he made it into a historical event, and that was a really big. Uh, a really big deal, and it changed the whole dynamic from a small action into a very small trigger event. So we have to ask the question, what is possible? Why not just shoot for the moon? Why not, you know, or Mars? Why not have pigs flying over the moon? Why don't we say we're going to do the largest civil disobedience in, in, in the world history? Why don't we say we're going to do a general strike? You know, we really have to say, okay, well, if, if having a big-ass vision 
with large levels of sacrifice and disruption, and that vision is what captivates people, why not just go really, really big? Is because you also have to balance, go to the next slide, you have to have a balance. You can't just, because if you go too big, then people don't believe you. They're like, there's no way you're going to, pigs are not going to fly over the moon. There's no way you're going to get that many people there. Uh, I don't believe it's going to be the largest civil disobedience in New York history. There's no way. So you have to, you have to balance in your epic vision uh, this you, excitement and creating a critical mass that's big enough, and you have to have, um, you have to have possible, it has to be possible and incredible with the resources you have. You really have to pull it off and people can kind of sense the credibility even within your organization and outside. So you need to balance those two. Next slide. Um, well before I, I just want to say this, uh, we, we had uh, an equation about what, you know, what what is the, the right balance of having a big epic vision and something that's also possible? And we say most of the time people side way too much on not going big enough. Go big or go home. You have to go big enough so that it actually creates that critical mass that's going to create your trigger event. If not, then it's a whole different equation, which we say is small actions. Small actions is about generating resources. It's not about creating trigger events. And you, you should put those all off to the side, structure-based actions that are creating maximum amounts of leverage and it's just thinking about leverage, you should, that's a different criteria. Prophetic promotion is about going big or going home, creating a, a critical mass that's going to get you that epic, going to get you that trigger event. And um, what you need to do really is, is we, we have a lot of ways to calculate this, but you have to have enough in the bag. You have to have enough resources and enough credibility so that when you announce it, it seems credible or you, we call it the lowest hanging fruit. You have to get certain amounts of people and the right people together so that when you announce it, it's credible or you have to be in the right time. So like Occupy announced something super big but it's in the media and it's super, lots of things are happening. So when it announces that it's going to do something, people are like, okay, well there's occupations all around the country. Why can't it take over Times Square? So. Anyways, you have to balance that. We have a lot of ways of thinking about that, and we'll get into that later. So we want to ask, well, what are good, ex good examples and bad examples of prophetic promotion? Because a lot of times we've seen these principles be used um, to create uh, actions. And so I want to sit down. I want, I want people to think about what are good examples and bad examples of prophetic promotion. If I was doing a training, we'd do an exercise and a discussion around that. Well, I just want to say, you know, uh, Occupy Wall Street is probably an example of, of bad prophetic promotion and good prophetic promotion because the original vision of Occupy Wall Street, when I saw it, I did not, I thought it was bad prophetic promotion because it was good in a lot of ways, but it was so big and there was no institutional support. It didn't get unions, it didn't get um, a lot of the local community players. Um, a lot of the uh, community organizations in New York and other places were not involved. It didn't have big speakers. It didn't have big promotion. And when they showed up, it was it was really a fringe uh, groups of of anarchists and and people who are not the traditional players. A lot of times, showed up to the first uh, you know the first days of that action. Um, it did have some some credible organizers and and stuff, but it, it didn't have it didn't have a lot of the institutional backing. And, but the thing is that, that really allowed it is that it had a big vision that it could escalate into. And if you look at the poster, it says, bring a tent. You know, how often do you have a labor action where they like, they're, they're going to give it time. They're going to, they're going to create suspense and it created suspense. They, they were in the park and they were like, are they going to get arrested or not? And they kept on doing actions and it created the opportunity for it to expand. And actually it did become a a prophecy. They prophesized it was going to be this huge thing that shut down um, Wall Street, that was going to be more and more disruptive, that was going to be huge, you know, tens of thousands of people. They said we're going to be out there and then in the end that's what happened. <laughs> so, uh, but it took, and, and Max in the presentation before this, uh, Max talks about how trigger events can create momentum that then generate the vision of the action. And, and with the World Trade Organization uh, protest and um, even in the immigrant rights movement, uh, with uh, um, with uh, May first general strike, is they announced a general strike. Like, 
whoa, but they announced it after they had a lot of other activity that they knew people were, were they, they were already mobilizing hundreds of thousands or we were already mobilizing hundreds of thousands of people before there was an announcement of a general strike. In the World Trade Organization, there was already a lot of credibility that made it so that uh, it was really credible that we were going to shut it, shut it down. And we, we announced in uh, A16, which was the, the, the protest against the World Bank IMF, uh, they actually uh, preemptively shut down the federal government because they were scared about all the protest activity. And that created a huge amount of momentum, the fact that there was all these articles about, you know, are the protesters going to come, are they going to shut it down, that created some buzz so that we knew we had enough credibility um, to bring more people in. So, uh, you know, a lot of, when, if you go back to that slide, you need to be able to understand, is there momentum already, can you generate some momentum just by the vision of the action, is it all, there already momentum there? And then you have to have a big vision, you have to have a big vision, uh, and you have to have an escalation plan that allows you to get to that vision. And that plan has to be really concrete to allow you to do that. And when you talk about, you go on to the next slide. Um, if you talk about uh, if you talk about bad prophetic promotion, a lot of times those are those are big actions. Uh, there was one concept called the wave of actions that happened just a year or two after um, Occupy and said it was going to be the largest wave of civil disobedience in the world history was going to happen. And you know it was it was way too big. They had no and they had no really calculated escalation plan on how to get there. There was no concrete way of thinking about how they were going to get the mass people arrested or the infrastructure to do that. Coney 2012, it was a small organization. They launched a, a, a video, a film, and it created massive amounts of momentum. And then they had they're supposedly going to have this big day of action and whatever, and it never really materialized. They didn't have a structure. They didn't have an escalation plan. But they, they did have an epic vision. But they, did, they didn't know how to use the momentum. They didn't have an escalation plan. So you need all three of those. And a lot of that is what we talk about in the next stage, which is the three accelerators. So if you go on to the next slide. And these are things that we feel are like best practices that help you with an escalation plan that allow you to be more credible. And with the three major accelerators, one thing, the, this is huge, is it, it allows you to create a very credible escalation plan, if you go to the next slide, is a pledge with the trigger. And what does that mean, a pledge with the trigger? Well, um, a, a great example of this is um, the Keystone uh, Pledge of Resistance, the Keystone Pipeline Pledge of Resistance, which is if the Keystone Pipeline was going to be built, uh, which would be huge, uh, um, Dr. Henson says it was game over for, for the climate if, if they could uh, harvest all this tar sand that's super toxic, it's horrible for the environment, and if, if they can actually get a pipeline to harvest all that, we're screwed. So there, there was this, this trigger, this really big event for a lot of people, and they said, if it gets okay, we're going to do this mass civil disobedience. And there, there, thousands of people started signing that, and it created momentum because there's a real credibility. People actually pledged that they would do it if it actually happened. But because it was a trigger in the future, it gave people the sense of, oh, if this future event happens, which is which is not happening right now, if it happens, I'm going to be really angry and then I will commit to doing this thing. And that made lots of other people pledge because, let's just be honest, do you want to be one of 10 people doing this action or do you want to be one of 10,000 people doing this action? And in the end, I think they have like 40, 50,000 people on this with a trigger that really makes a lot of sense, which is about whether or not the Keystone Pipeline is going to be created. The trigger to us is what creates the credibility because um, and I think one of the biggest triggers is numbers saying, will you pledge to be one of 10,000 or one of 1,000? Or, and when you start getting more and more people signing up and people see that they're going to be one of, of, of a couple hundred um, that are already pledged to, to do CD, then it gives the credibility like, okay, this is really going to happen, this is real. And you can also start measuring and going through a process of making those pledges into real arrest pledges. And we have a system of doing that, of understanding how many people you can get on pledges, how many people you can translate into real confirmations. We've sort of, we figured out some systems, it's not perfect, but 
it, it really is a big deal to have real pledges of people saying they're going to get arrested or they're going to do hunger strikes or whatever. And if you get people that are the first ones to commit, then it, it creates a spiral effect. And the trigger is really important. And the, what the trigger does is allows it to be more credible. And what we recommend a lot of times is make, it, make the trigger say, when you go to an organization, you say, will you be one of 10 organizations or will you be one of 1,000 people getting arrested or 10,000 people getting arrested? And when you do that, that really changes, um, that really changes the dynamic of the of the actions of what they're willing to credit what they're willing to commit because in some ways it's less risky for them to say okay I will give you so much but only if you can get that commitment among lots of other people and then when when you hit that trigger of everyone committing at the same time then it it, it boosts the action in, in an incredible way so there's a lot in in the union uh, in the labor movement, they do this a lot around um, what they call strike votes, which is it's very hard to get workers to go on strike because they're afraid they're going to um, uh, lose their job. It's, it's really risky to do a wildcat strike if it's just one person. But if everyone does it at the same time, there's much less risk about it. And there's a lot of ways in which civil resistance talks about this, lowering the risk, lowering the liability that individuals play, and the pledge is a really helpful way. If, if a majority of people in the workplace vote to go on strike and commit to doing it, then, uh, then we're going to go on strike, and then people feel very confident that they can do it, and that it's going to be powerful, and that it's not going to be as risky for them. So we really recommend create a pledge and think about what the trigger can be. Is the trigger going to be a certain number? If you get to 1,000, you're going to do the action. If we get 20 people hunger striking for 30 days, and we're going to do it. Is it, is it around, um, is a trigger around a certain event? Like in the 90s, when they started this idea of the Pledge of Resistance, they said if the United States is going to go and do an invasion of <coughs> Nicaragua or El Salvador, then we're going to do mass civil disobedience. And everyone's like, man, if the United States is going to invade El Salvador and Nicaragua, that is so crazy, it's so horrible that I have to do something out of conscience. So that pledge allowed lots of people to commit to it um, before it, the, the, it actually happened, and it created a lot of um, deterrent for the politicians because they were like, "Oh wow, if we actually do this, uh, if we actually do this invasion, which they were planning, uh, it's going to create huge uh, disruption and chaos and public backlash." So the next thing that we talk about when we talk about accelerators, if you can go into the next slide, we know is next slide, is we call it team belief. Okay, Now, um, it's one thing that we say we, ha we have to have credibility so people actually believe in it. But when you're starting, it's hard to believe. It's hard to believe that you're going to pull off the largest civil disobedience in Los Angeles history when we were doing September 28th. And a lot of union organizers had never experienced doing a, a, a big action like that when we were organizing within a union. Um, and uh, they had not had experience. Some of these really amazing organizers who had actually planned strikes, <laughs> where they got where workers did these huge uh, sacrifices uh, to go out on strike. So they, these organizers knew how to move people, and they knew how to how to really create actions that mobilize people to, to make deep sacrifice and disruption. But they really it was very hard for them to think outside the box and do prophetic promotion and believe in the prophecy of something that they had never done before. And so a lot of those organizers did not were not able to really get people to commit to it or to, to sign a pledge or to do whatever because they didn't really believe in it. While a lot of students who had no organizing experience really believed in it. And when we were doing this we, we had a team and we would do, um, we would pitch the action again and again, and we would really go through all the fear and all all the reservations people had about whether or not it was actually possible, because they had to feel that they could really believe in it. The prophecy uh, in in the in the Christian Judeo-Christian tradition, prophecy happens because partly because of faith, because the the prophet believes that uh, it, it it's going to happen or that. Uh, this vision of the future is going to be a reality, but it takes a lot of faith to believe in that, and then it becomes the faith becomes the reality because you can it becomes contagious. If you believe it and you're doing a presentation, other people can believe it too, and you can help other people go through that process. So the, you have to get your team and the core people that start it and the lowest hanging fruit. It's like a snowball. That snowball has to be has to be 
tough and it has to really believe and it has to get enough people so that more and more and more and more people believe and then it becomes contagious. It gets to a point where enough people believe, enough people are pledging for, to make sacrifice and disruption that it's inevitable. You know, when you have 10,000 people on that pledge, it, it's, it, of course it looks credible. You know, you have, you have that many people that are going to do it. But the first hundred, the first twenty, the first hundred, the first um, a thousand, that's those are the hardest, uh, you know, the hardest numbers to get, and it really starts by people making the sacrifices. When we, when we were planning a, a hunger strike, um, and we were pitching this as like the largest hunger strike in Los Angeles history in the immigrant rights movement, uh, we, I went to Maria Elena Durazo, who had done, she had planned many strikes. She was a local celebrity, labor leader, immigrant rights leader, and she said, "There's no way you are going to get." 12 people to hunger strike for 22 days. I mean, uh, Cesar Chavez, you know, Dolores Huerta told us Cesar Chavez really only fasted um, most of the time. Uh, his fast only lasted like 14 days, and he had health problems on the, on the 10th day. It's like, there's no way you're going to get that, pe that amount of people to make sacrifices. But when we got two or three people who are, are were these leaders, these immigrant rights leaders that made these, you know, incredible commitments, uh, Raul. Uh, Norbe uh, of Adepska, he he made a commitment to do the 22-day fast, and he was so committed and believed in the vision of having multiple people do it. Everyone else, it, it became easier because that became a reality. The sacrifice, and also, we had we had hundreds of people then say, "Oh yeah, if there's 20, Raul is going to fast for 22 days." For them, it was like, "I'll fast for a week. I'll fast for four days." When before it was hard to get people to fast for a day, now it was easy to get everyone fasting for three days or uh, hundreds of people fasting for a day because there was a, a core of someone making deep sacrifices to build around. The next one, next slide. Next slide. So, um, when you're organizing within a structure, you're really working and focusing on how do I mobilize the people that are the activists that are within that that my organizers can talk to within the workplaces. But when you're doing prophetic promotion, it's mobilizing outside your structures. That means you need to have marketing, you need to have promotion, you need to create buzz, you need to create a media event so that people understand about this action that you don't have a relationship with. And a lot of that has to do with um, creating promotion materials and thinking about it as promoting it everywhere, getting a buzz so that everyone knows about it even if it's not you, even if it's they don't know you or know your organization. And this takes media, it takes, um, it takes reaching out to lots of different groups outside of your traditional uh, structures and, and the tra traditional people. So uh, if you go to the next slide. So when we were doing this on September 28th, the largest civil disobedience in Los Angeles history for Immigrant rights. Uh, we 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 had a metrics uh, about how to do this, which is we had presentations that were we had a uh, like a two minute spiel, we had like a six minute pitch, we had a a uh, a twelve minute pitch, um, and we had we had like a forty five minute sort of um, where we did a, a presentation where we had dialogue from the audience and. We had a speaker come, so uh, and we knew that every time we did a presentation to an organization or to a student activist group or on a campus in a student in a in a classroom, that we would get uh, a certain amount of people around. You know, two to four people would sign up to get arrested or to show up to the action. Or we, I don't know exactly what the metrics were, what the numbers were, but we had an understanding that if we did a hundred presentations. In colleges all over Los Angeles, we would we would meet the numbers of getting 400 students arrested. You have to do the numbers; it has to be specific. You need to promote, and you need to understand how many times you need to promote and where you need to promote to actually get the numbers you need. And some of this is going to be done online in the media. And you know, if you do a sample group within a, an email list of 2,000 or 10,000, that when you when you send out a test sample that you're going to get a certain amount of people to commit from that base of people. So you know that you need to get it out over these big email lists so that you can get some initial pledges or and you can get a certain amount that you need. And so the email lists, 
and also doing face-to-face -face presentations. You need to do that all over the place, and you need to do it multiple times to build your numbers. And and that's what th – there's a lot of other things that create the buzz, but that is really where you're going to get a bulk of your pledges. Next. Oh, just – I want to say this. Uh, college campuses are huge. I mean, m most of the time in, during civil resistance, the people that are the lowest hanging fruit in that, that – that are really interested in, in doing these types of actions and are, are very conscious of the issues are people on college campuses. College campuses have their own ecosystem uh, that can create buzz and create hype and create um, momentum on a campus that is isolated from the rest of the world. And so in some ways it really helps to go to college campuses and have student organizers and whatever so that um, we can we can generate the buzz on campus and also um, really reach out because they're the their students are the ones a lot of times that can make the sacrifice they're first ones that can choose to make a sacrifice so um, uh, so if you you need to figure out how many you could do tons and tons of college presentations and get those students in and that creates the first the first tier of people where other people then get interested because they see that a lot of students are really uh, are really interested in participating. But the second thing is big speakers, big endorsers, and rock uh, stars, hip hop stars, people who are uh, already have a base of people that listen to them, that uh, talk to them. It creates uh, massive amounts of credibility with the press and with the public to have those big speakers, those big endorsers say they're going to get arrested or they're going to participate. Um, and even having big speakers come and do promotional stuff, saying, I'm going to come to this action. You need to come to the action, too. Um, I've seen this happen many, many times. Ralph Nader uh, went around and did events to support Seattle. And at the time, Ralph Nader was really big. He's less so now. But he really helped get a lot of people arrested, even in, in uh, western Massachusetts in the, the, the uh, five college or four college area. Um, he really got a lot of people committed to doing the action because they would show up to hear Ralph Nader speak. We had like, uh, I don't know, 800 people show up to his speaking event, and we got a huge portion of those people to commit to coming to the action and getting arrested. And when Cornell West comes, goes to campus to campus, he can get hundreds and hundreds of people to, to listen to him for two hours. He's a very powerful speaker, and if he really endorses the action, people say, this is real. I really want to belong to it. Dolores Huerta in September 26th went around and did college presentations at three or four campuses. We had about, I think, about 100 students sign up to get arrested because uh, Dolores Huerta was talking about the action, saying she was going to get arrested and asking other people to get arrested with her. Um, and t having Tom Morella get arrested with us, have Ben Harper do a concert with us, all created uh, buzz uh, even before the action happened. And so having those big speakers, those big endorsers, even if you have one or two at the very beginning, it really changes the whole dynamic of credibility for your action. Next slide. Next slide. So the next thing we're really talking about is guerrilla marketing materials. Um, so those are posters, those are YouTube videos with the pitch of the action, um, those are uh, those are having your pitch really down so lots of it can go viral. So lots of people can do the pitch. Can talk about it. They have promotional materials so it can generate the buzz. A lot of that we call that guerrilla marketing because um, if you have access to the media, like during the immigrant rights movement, um, uh, Pete Olin and uh, Kukui, which were two famous uh, radio DJs, Latino radio DJs, Spanish language uh, radio DJs, would promote the action, and that was incredibly uh, helpful to generate buzz and marketing and whatever because they had. They had access to, this, to the media, but you don't have access. You have to create buzz through uncon unconventional um, channels, which is postering all over the campus or in lots of different places to create a buzz or doing wheat pasting, doing YouTube videos uh, and blasting them out on, on e a mass email list. Uh, getting... Mass email and social media is very helpful with guerrilla marketing, uh, and you need to create the fun, interactive ways to engage the public and around the action. 
in September 28th, we created a little YouTube video, which we're going to play uh, a YouTube video, not of that action, but another action, which we realized, you know, now it, it, can, be, it can be done much better because you can do animation and things. But even having a little bit of a pitch uh, allows lots of people to present. If you have a video, a lot of times the film about the issue, that really helps too because it allows people who aren't experts or aren't good public speakers to be able to do a presentation and just to play the video and then and then give a pitch about how people should participate. Next. Next. So the the um, the next one, and this is the last one, uh, slide about we think these are really critical um, a really critical element that allows their accelerators or best practices is you need an action training. Uh, I think the graphic is not showing up, but what an action training is, is you once people are confirmed to this pledge, you need to get them to come to an action training, and this does a variety of different things. First thing it does is it when they come to the action, they get excited by the action, and they become promoters of the action. So once somebody agrees to get arrested, and then they're, they're really committed to doing it, and they go to an action training that's like two to three, sometimes four hours long. They get excited by the action and the vision of the action. They learn how to pitch the action, and they become then, uh, they pull their sacrifice, and their excitement pulls other people in. Like, and we say this all the time, uh, that a lot of times, the people that are, the, that are mobilized on campus has to do because they first, we have a, a core group that commits to making a big sacrifice of getting arrested and that moves the campus to become interested in the, in the action and they become the promoters. So um, and as, there's many, many examples of this in the civil rights movement is SNCC would go in, organize students to, to get arrested and that would pull other people in and they became the promoters. The sacrifice and the, the, of getting arrested and the people making that sacrifice then generated the buzz in the media. But you have to have an action scenario so that th those confirmations are real and that you're doing them over and over. We did tons of action trainings and whenever in the mass protest uh, movement around global justice or ACT UP or um, the direct action movement, that this was part of the tradition is that we just during in a, in a, like a convergence center, there was non-violence trainings all the time, and that got people prepared and excited by the action, got people to make a real deep commitment. Another thing that's really important is it's really important that people understand what they're sacrificing for and whether or not they're really ready for it, um, and uh, prepare them to get arrested and, uh, and not go through uh, you know a form of traumatization or or problems in the action and also to make sure that they maintain nonviolent discipline and whatever agreements you have that are important for your movement, uh, anti-oppression framework or whatever it is that you need in your movement to make sure, uh, not just not just for, for every participant but for, I mean not just for every like uh, high level leader but you, you know you need a certain level of commitment from the base of people uh, who they might not be in your movement but participating in an action uh, you want them to to believe in. You need to incorporate a little bit of that into the action um, training, even if it's if it's um, if it's action agreements that they do certain things in the action that make it so that they don't isolate other people or do things that are harmful to the movement in the press. And we're going to talk a lot more about that in polarization and in active public support is negative things that the movement does that doesn't generate active public support. So your action training really helps people do that. It's mass training and, and it's mass training around an action. That's really the concept. We're going to talk a lot about mass training, but action trainings are really important uh, to do and to do all, you, you do them all the time. Okay. So now we're going to do, we're going to do an exercise and the exercise that we're going to do first thing I'm going to uh, right not right now uh, but we're going to we're going to attach a a YouTube video and this YouTube video um, was a hypothetical we actually we did some uh, 14 different cities did did um, sit-ins in health insurance offices to demand that people who are critically ill get covered uh, by these insurance companies who were greedy bastards that did not even cover their own clients, their own uh, insurers, uh, and we were proving that private insurance is the real death panels, that they're really denying people that need critical care, and that the public option and Medicare for all is what we need instead. And so we were creating an action that demanded that people who were dying 
Um, the first person we did an action around was dying of AIDS and could not get critical treatment because the insurance company said it was too much money. We did a sit-in and he actually got uh, treatment. And so what we have, there's hundreds and hundreds of people that, um, that are denied care. So we demanded that they cover the people that they've been denying care to. And we did sit-ins until they, until they caved. And we would sit in their offices. And in a couple cases, they let us sit there for, for overnight or for a day. Um, but we did these sit-ins all over the place. Um, and it, the buzz before the action was actually really good. We created a lot of buzz. It did not turn into a trigger event for a lot of reasons, but it did create a lot of internal buzz, partly because of our YouTube video <laughs> was really good. Thousands of people watched that YouTube video, and it created buzz and got a lot of people committed to the action. And it was a vision of how do we take this moment from the weather, which is about Obamacare, and how do we turn it into an action, a uh, historic action, um, around a historic event, which is passing health care reform in the United States and America. And so we created a, I think it was a seven or eight minute YouTube video. It's not perfect. We did not have that many resources, but it kind of gives you some of the elements of prophetic promotion and how we pitched an, an epic action. And it's in, it has some graphics, you know, they're not that great, but you can kind of see a little bit of how that is. And we're, what we want in this presentation is for people to really, um, Design an epic, epic action. Pick a hypo, hypothetical, popular. This is a hypothetical epic action. Pick a hypothetical, popular, symbolic demand, and they need to have a. They need to frame the victory to pick a symbolic victory that will come and flush it out. Five to seven minutes to pitch this action, and then we're going to have some feedback about what works about it. And I'm going to ask some questions to different people uh, to flush out what the action scenario is, whether what principles they have used from prophetic promotion, and then we're going to have the audience really participate in talking about what worked about the pitch. So uh, I'm sorry. So right now we're going to do five minutes. Uh, we're not going to do the seven minutes. We're going to do five minutes, and then we're going to have um, two to three minutes of comments about it. So we're going to hook that uh, YouTube video up to this uh, webinar after we. Um, uh, we're gonna we're gonna quit and then we're going to show that YouTube at the end, um, and so when we do that. It really helps to do the exercise of formulate a prophetic promotion pitch, pitch it, see if it works, get feedback, fine tune it. And when we do this exercise, a lot of time with the core team that's pitching the action, we really fine tune it. We do it many many times and we get a, a pitch that really works using um, the meta narrative of the movement, which is really important before you even pitch the action to have a good meta narrative that we talk about in um, another training, or you can learn about very well through uh, the Center for Story-Based Strategies. Uh, does wonderful trainings about how to do meta-narrative. But we're, not, we're just talking about how to do prophetic promotion around a pitch.